just introduce Jonathan. Um, he's currently studying in his third year of Deakin Medicine. Uh, Jonathan is a graduate of Deakin Biomedical Science uh, program and med mentor and passionate about helping undergrads navigate their way through their medical application process. Jonathan's route to medicine was anything but ordinary. And after studying at both RMIT and Monash for degrees in commerce and arts, Jonathan was left feeling rather uh, rudderless as to where he wanted to go after working in a job, wanted to go in his career after a year, after a year, sorry, after a year spent overseas and after working in a job that was anything but fulfilling and decided to pursue his dream of becoming a doctor. With more than a few strokes of luck and once in a lifetime opportunities, Jonathan's description of his journey to medicine will hopefully be as entertaining as informative. Jonathan will talk to you through his journey, dish out advice, offer up tips and tricks and about life in medical school. He will be more than happy to field any questions you have for him. Lovely, thank you so much. We'll take it away, Jonathan. Good day, everybody. So thanks for that, Jet. Um, those are some lovely words that you read there that were um, definitely not written by me and sent through a, t a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, so today I'm just going to chat to you about my journey through medicine, my journey through undergrad, um, and being where I am now. Um, I'm just going to do a presentation. Um, if people like something that I say, because I can't see anybody's faces really. Just write ha 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 or lol in the chat so I know that I'm, uh, that I'm doing the right thing. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to just uh, interrupt me at any time. Okay, so I'm just gonna share my screen. All right. Away from the start. Okay, so this little presentation I like to call the hard way um, or how I stopped worrying and learned to love the grind. Um, Jonathan Somic, uh, that's me. Okay, so who am I? Uh, I'm currently a third year medical student at Deakin. Um, I'm a graduate of a Bachelor of Biomedical Science from Deakin. I'm a former Dubs member um, and I might still be a current Dubs member. I don't know if that ever expires. Um, but I can't remember any money being taken out of my account, so I'm probably not a current Dubs member. Um, I'm currently rotating through the Geelong Clinical School. Um, I'm a dog owner and I'm a trivia buff. Um, this is my LinkedIn profile. This is what I want people who uh, don't know me to see. Um, but this is probably what people who know me will uh, see and uh, know me as. Um, so yeah, um, I'm just gonna check the chat for any, any laughter and uh, none yet. Okay, so how did I get here? Um, I was born in 1988, so you do the math. Um, I started Deakin undergrad when I was 26 or 27, which makes me a mature age student. Um, I'm currently 32. Uh, so I graduated high school in 2005. I did drama, media, French, Spanish, and English literature. So the perfect um, preparation for getting into medicine, but an even more perfect preparation for um, being rudderless and not really knowing where I wanted to go. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I auditioned for the VCA to try and get into their Bachelor of Fine Arts and Acting. Um, I got a few callbacks, but never really, um, never really progressed anywhere. Um, so I did the other thing that people do when they don't really know what they want to do. And I decided to do a Bachelor of Business. Um, no offense to anybody who is a Bachelor of Business graduate, but it's kind of a fallback for, well, it was a fallback for me. I didn't do very well, mainly because I just didn't really enjoy it. Um, so I decided to kind of pull the pin on it. And I traveled from 2009 to 2010 and I met a lot of wonderful people. I went overseas um, and yeah, just kind of decided that maybe I wanted to do a little bit more with my life and reach some potentials that I thought that I had. So when I came back, I decided to do a Bachelor of Global Arts. I wanted to become a translator, be it in French, German or Spanish. 
um, and then quickly realize that um, it's very hard to become a translator when you're competing against people who are bilingual and have been speaking it since birth. Um, so again, I decided to pull the pin on that and uh, just worked. I worked for a few years in a job that I really didn't like and, and I think that that showed um, because I ended up just being losing my job in a reshuffle, being without work for a few months and then, um, well, this happened. Um, I ended up being lucky enough to be selected to go on a quiz show on Channel 7. It was called Million Dollar Minute. I don't expect anybody here to remember it, but um, I reckon if you ask your grandparents, they will know it. Um, that's what that asterisk there is at the end of 15 minutes of fame, because the only people that ever recognized me were 80 year old women in Kmart or Big W. And that happened uh, less than three times. So two times. Um, so I got very lucky enough to be selected to go into this show and something else happened and came from that is that I'd always had this inkling that I wanted to study medicine um, but really didn't have anything burning my feet or any pressure um, really behind me to do it so I thought that I'd put the idea out into the world and every night I was on for five nights and every night at the end they'd ask me what I'm going to do with the money and I said I'm going to become a doctor I'm going to study medicine and I'm going to become a doctor this is something that, that had been kind of brewing in my mind for a long time. When I finished high school, there was no postgraduate entry medicine. So if you didn't get in through year 12, you didn't get into medicine. Um, uh, so yeah, and like I've got written there, there's nothing like throwing an idea out into the world to put the pressure on. And what that ended up happening was that people that I knew or people that I saw me would always ask me how my journey was going. Are you a doctor yet? My grandma, are you a doctor? Are you a doctor? She would always tell me. Um, and I said, no, not yet. Um, but what it meant is that there was, you know, more of a reason for me to start studying hard. Um, and so I decided to be where a lot of you are now and decided to do Deakin Biomed. So from 2015 to 2017, um, I was a Deakin Biomed undergrad. And then I realized then that the struggle really is real. Um, I don't know if you remember from the subjects I did before, but I hadn't actually done science or math since year 10. And by this point it was 10 or 11 years since that. Um, so that what is chemistry is definitely um, what I felt. And uh, these are the results from my first year and a bit, um, the 59 and a 66 in the, in the kind of chemistries there. These were struggles for me, the 59s and the 66. So um, they're probably, yeah, probably what I deserved. Um, this is another meme that I found when I looked up chemistry memes online. Um, uh, I don't understand it, so I don't know if it's funny, but um, yeah, I guess it's funny. Um, probably people who are studying for the GAMSAT now will get it. Let me know in the chat if you think it's funny. Um, so yeah, so this is my little spiel here, how to succeed in undergrad. So this is a little quote that I've been, that I found recently that I think that for you guys, it would be amazing to kind of work from. Um, so it's embarrassment's the cost of entry. If you aren't willing to look like a foolish beginner, um, you'll never become a graceful master. And what I take from this is that a lot of the time you might be sitting in class, or you might be sitting in lecture thinking to yourself, oh, you know, I don't really know what, what this is, and, but nobody else seems to be, you know, struggling with it. So I'm not really going to ask anybody because you don't want to look like an idiot in front of everybody. Um, and I definitely feel that. I definitely felt that. And I feel like that's only detrimental to your learning. If, you, um, if you're willing to make yourself look like a fool in front of other people, you're going to overtake them because they haven't had the practice in asking the questions that need to be asked. Um, and also there's research into how traumatic experiences help cement memories. So um, it's probably a good study technique if you ask a question in front of four or 500 people in a lecture, because you'll never forget the answer. Um, so how to succeed in undergrad. So really don't be afraid to ask for help for time or for both. Um, 
you can ask a few, you can ask peers, you can ask staff, but you really need to be willing to put yourself out there. Going it alone is probably the hardest thing that you can ever do. Um, so yeah, with your peers, these will be your bedrock. Surround yourself with people on the same level or on the same path as you. That, that doesn't have to be medicine. That can be research. That can be, you know, people that just want to do well. Um, surround yourself with like-minded people because they will, you know, they'll pull you up as you pull them up and then, you know, everybody does well. It also make your lows less low. So it can be hard trying to get into medicine. It can be hard getting a mark that you don't feel like you deserved. Um, and having people around you to, to kind of talk and debrief with is, um, you know, it's just innumerable. Um, and then when you do do well, it makes your highs even higher because you can share it with other people. It's not a solo effort. Um, it's, you know, it's a team effort and that, and, and that will help you throughout life, you know, and especially in medicine, once you get in, um, go to past sessions. I don't know if they're still running due to COVID, but if you can go to those sessions and again, don't be afraid to look like a fool, um, because, you know, it's free, you know, it's free education. A lot of people around the world would love, um, the access to the education that we have. So please don't take it for granted. Our private study, uh, this is probably where I did the most um, of my time in undergrad is that I had a few friends, Ryan and Daniel. Um, they were, the three of us would just study, you know, for hours and hours and hours and it becomes fun and you don't realise like how much you're actually getting in. Um, but if you're, if you feel like you're not really a social butterfly and you need help finding people, you just, you know, Deacon makes it easier. They assign you people. Um, they assign you lab partners, probably not now during COVID, but you know, in the next few years or before, people in your allocated group assignments, you know, ask them if they want to go through, they're obviously in your unit, ask them if they want to study for the mid, mid um, tries or the end of semester exams. And then also just do friends that you've known from before. So if you know somebody who's at maybe Melbourne Biomed or Monash, Bio, Monash Biomed or Melbourne Science, if they want to study with you, because they'll have come from, from a different perspective. And then just people from clubs and societies, Deacon, you, um, the Biomed Society, the Deacon Science Society, you know, they're all in it together um, and you can only make each other stronger. Uh, also make time to see your friends outside of uni, make time for social activities. Um, if you feel like you have to give up social activities to study, you know, you can probably get away with not studying for that hour or two and you'd probably be better off going to a party um, or a 21st or whatever. Again, this is uh, probably more important pre and post COVID. Um, and then, like I said, get involved in as many societies and clubs as you can because you know, you're going to be forced to socialise. Collaborate. Collaboration with other people is uh, probably key, but don't collude. Um, that's just a, a thing that I put in there because I wanted to put collaborate, but also I wanted to put a legal disclaimer so I didn't get in trouble by academic integrity. So close enough that uh, uh, nobody knows that you work together. And then also if you want to get involved in Med Mentors, which is a group of Deakin University medical students who are very happy to mentor um, undergrads who want to get into medicine. Um, so peers, and now we're probably going to talk, just talk about the staff that, how they can help you. So these are the four faces that I remember most from Deakin Biomed. Does anybody else know these guys? Shake your heads or thumbs up. There's Bernard, Kieran, um, Peter Beach and Chris Lim. Um, they won't bite ask them for help, send them messages. They want you to do well. Um, like I said, they won't bite even the scary ones. Maybe not so much and definitely not a scary one there. Um, put your hand up, ask a stupid question. Don't let embarrassment get in the way of your learning. If you have a question in your head, if you're in a room of 400 people or if you're in a Zoom of 50 or 60 people, if you've got the question, it's very likely that somebody else has the question. Um, 
And these guys have, you know, PhDs, they have undergrads, they have postdoctorate studies. They can answer your question in two seconds um, and be able to explain it better than any Google search could. Um, if you're struggling, they need to be your first port of call because like I said, they want you to do well. Uh, I thought I'd add Craig from, um, who spoke yesterday. Um, he's also really wonderful. And I think that he still teaches pharmacology to you guys. Um, he was really great for me in, in, my last, uh, in my last year at Deakin, so yeah. So what does early success in undergrad kind of mean for med entry? Why do, you, why do I want you guys to do well in undergrad? Because the earlier you find your feet, the easier everything becomes. Uh, the way that medicine set out, if you have a really good GPA, um, that's the best foundation. So if you have a good GPA, it's easier to get a good GAMS, it's easier to increase your GAMSAT score than it is to improve your GPA, especially if you finish your degree. Um, so if you hit the ground running, if you know that you need to get marks, good marks from early on, it'll make everything easier. If you do well in chemistry in first year, if you do well in biology or physics or cells and genes, um, it'll make subsequent study easier because you don't have to relearn basic concepts. Um, and like I said, it's easier to improve a set than it is to improve a mark from your first year. A lot of, you know, that's, that's talking from, um, from, a, from a, an area of privilege because I, I find the GAMSAT quite easy to improve on and other people very, very um, struggle a lot with it. Um, yeah, if you did struggle early on, that is fine. It's not the end of the world. Um, you're just gonna have to work harder to drag your scores up. Luckily, like I said, the GPA guidelines, again, they may have changed due to COVID, I'm not sure, but when I finish and maybe next year, um, they reward you doing well in your last year and the year before. So if you have a bad first year and you're worried that you'll never get into medicine, please don't worry. Um, you're just going to have to work a little bit harder later on. Um, if, you ha if you have electives, do them late and do them easy. So if you have electives, do them in your third year so that they count for your third year GPA. Um, and then they pull them up and then, you know, do easy ones, do things that you think that you'll enjoy do first year subjects in third year um, whenever you can, just to kind of drag your GPA up. Um, and again, this is, you know, this is, might sound a bit harsh, but undergrad isn't hard. Neither is medicine. It's just the work that you have to put in. If you're willing to put the work in, it's, um, if you're willing to put the work in, it is what uh, you'll be able to get through it. Um, like I said before, if you have a bad first year, you can make up for it. This was me. So my first year GPA on a scale of seven was 5.7. The second year, things got a little bit better. And then in the last year, I ended up getting seven HDs and one distinction. So um, yeah, that kind of pulled me up. Uh, those three together left me with a GPA of about 6.4 or 6.5 when I was applying for medicine. So yeah, just continuous improvement. Um, yeah. Hold on one second. Um, next one. So yeah, like I said before, chemistry for the professional sciences. These are the two chemistry um, subjects I did in the first year. And this was uh, the last semester of my last year. Uh, I didn't, this, there's no reason for me to show these just because I just wanted to show off how, um, how well I did in my last year. Uh, because me and my housemates are talking about how marks in undergrad don't mean anything. Well, you know, they mean something now. Um, all right, so for the GAMSAT, you just have to start preparing early. Get used to GAMSAT style questions. There's lots of resources out there um, where you can figure out what GAMSAT style questions are. It's not like questions in your, um, in your undergrad exams, you know, the obvious answer usually isn't the right answer. Um, and you can't always know things. You have to be able to reason things because the GAMSAT's looking for um, people who'll be able to reason themselves out of situations with the information that's been given to them. Um, find peers that will push you and pull you up with them. So you need to be able to find a group. Again, it could be the same people as before. You find them through past 
groups, you, part, you find them through societies, people that if you see people that you, have, if you hear people in the library talking about the GAMSAT, um, go up to them and ask them if you can join them. Um, because, you know, again, collaboration is key. And then do your research, Paging Doctor. Um, I don't know if you guys know about that, but it's got an amazing resources of what you need um, and kind of the scores that you probably need to get into medicine. Um, there's also a 10 year retrospective study on the GAMSAT that talks about the actual style of questions. So if you like the idea of game theory or you like the idea of testing theory, um, you can actually look at the at how the GAMSAT questions are written and then how scores are um, collated from there. Um, the main thing that you can get from this is that, uh, how many people here have done the GAMSAT before? Yeah, a few people, yep. Yeah, I think quite a few. Yeah, so um, what you need to realize is that don't fall in love with questions because from this, uh, from this paper, I found out that they don't mark all the questions. A certain segment of the questions are actually test questions for future GAMSATs, so they're not even marked. So don't get upset about a question that you feel like you got wrong, that you should have gotten right, because it might not even count. And again, don't spend time on a question. Um, don't spend time on a question because again, it might not count and you're just wasting time. Um, and then there are so many study groups online. The GAMSAT study group 2020 on Facebook is a really good one. Um, and it's got thousands of people and it's good for up-to-date information. Um, so yeah, like I said before, I, I found the GAMSAT, you know, this first one was a struggle. I came out of it really confident and I thought that I did amazingly. And um, I opened up the email and found that, uh, that mark there. And then the next one with a little bit more study, I turned up to a 60. And then in March, 2017, so the last year of my undergrad, I ended up getting a 65, um, which is the score that I actually applied with. Um, and then I sat it one more time in September and I'll probably tell you why I sat that next. So then um, kind of, I applied for medicine. I put Deacon first and then this happened. So I got an email from Gemsas. Uh, this is an infamous email of death saying that I was unable to gain entry for medicine, Deacon medicine in 2018. Um, and it was heartbreaking. You feel like um, you feel like all the work that you've put in is just for nothing, and you you ask yourself, what more could I have done? You think about three or four years earlier about what you could have done differently if I'd gone to this class and I got this mark, you know. But you end up moving on. Uh, life goes on. You make plans to, you know, do honors or to do post grad, and then you decide to um, or go overseas but then uh, for me this happened I received an email maybe three weeks after my email of death saying that uh, Gemsys had made a bit of a mistake and they had apply forgot to apply some bonuses for me so what that meant is that I did have the uh, uh, the right to interview but I only had two days to prepare for it um, and prepare I did I don't think I slept in those two days. Um, and I kind of uh, spent a lot of money, exorbitant amount of money on uh, private tutoring and then in, uh, roped in a, a very smart guy from my undergrad named Sonny, who's a bit of a, a savant, a genius, if you will. Um, and uh, he told me that I was the worst person that he'd ever seen interview, which was really good for my confidence. Um, <laughs> But what I ended up doing was just going in there, realizing that again, you know, if I don't get in, I don't get in, life will go on. But luckily for me, um, I got in. So Deacon Medicine, this is probably where a lot of you, if you want to go medicine, will be putting as your first, pre first preference and r rightfully so. I, I, I agree that I think that Deacon is the, um, probably the best medical school in Victoria which is saying a lot considering the reputation that Melbourne and Monash have, but um, Deacon 
loves their students, they take care of their students, they support their students, and they want you all to do well in a, in a collaborative and communal society. Um, and they really, really care about their students and they want, want us to do well. Um, what this kind of means though, is that I had to move away from my family. Uh, my partner in Melbourne, we decided that I would move down from Monday through Friday and then come back up on the weekends. These are the expectations that you have for Geelong life. This is Eastern Beach here. Um, that's Westfield, that's the, uh, the hospital. Um, but this is more like the reality for the first two years of Deakin Medicine, which is uh, going to the Warren Ponds shopping center in the middle of the night to get snacks for a study after a study session. Um, this is where me and my housemates spend a lot of time in the first two years of medicine. Um, but this is also reality. So medicine is fun. Medicine's more fun than, you know, than you can possibly think you're in it. You're in it. There's, you're surrounded by like-minded people who, um, you know, are on the same level as you, um, who have the same goals as you and you get to get your hands dirty. Um, and they really put a lot of trust into you and a lot of investment into you because, um, Training medical students is tough and it's expensive, so they really want you to do well. So never feel like you, um, uh, yeah, you'll never feel like you're floundering if you ask for support from your peers and from other people. Um, so for those that really don't know, I thought I'd talk through what the course structure at Deakin Medicine is like. So the first two years at Deakin are preclinical years where you're doing a lot of, um, uh, theory-based learning, a lot of simulations, a lot of non-practical stuff. Um, and then the last two years are your clinical years where you're actually rotating through hospitals and health services. This differs from uh, Melbourne, which has only one year of preclinical pre and then three years of clinical years. Um, so the preclinical years, they're entirely in warm ponds. Um, so make from that what you will. It's, it's an easy life down there, but it's not as fun as Melbourne. Um, if you are worried about um, leaving your family in Melbourne, there are you know, a large minority of people who um, do commute every day. Um, you just pick the, um, the sessions or the, the things that you feel like you have to go see in person and then you just will have to, um, you can do your, some of the theory stuff and lectures online just like with Deakin. Um, so these pre-clinical pre years kind of um, have your essential knowledge in anatomy, physiology, biology, clinical skills, and ethics. Um, pretty much everything to set you up for a life in medicine, and, but mainly to set you up for your clinical years in the hospitals. Um, there is no presumed knowledge. So you can go in with law degrees. You can go in with business degrees, like I mentioned earlier. You can go in with music degrees, and you will learn everything you need to know in these first two years. Um, it is fast, it is a lot of work. So uh, what I like to, what I remember is that we had a biochem lecture that felt like the whole unit of biochemistry from undergrad in three hours. Um, and that's the pace that they're trying to, that they want you to be learning at. Uh, there's a huge focus at Deakins on Indigenous, at Deakin at, on Indigenous and rural health, um, as there should be. It's a it's an area of healthcare that is um, subpar compared to the rest of the population. Um, and Deakin prides itself on how well it teaches Indigenous and rural health. In first year, you do a one week um, cultural immersion in the local Indigenous community down here in Geelong. Um, and that's probably one of the best weeks of the first year. Um, you'll do placements throughout the first two years in kind of allied health and in GP practices and hospital settings. Um, you know, they're one day, one day maybe every two weeks, um, but the years are long. So Deakin trimesters are short, maybe 11 weeks for a trimester, um, whereas semesters are in medicine are 23 week semesters with one week breaks in between the two of them. So you get tired, you feel like it's never ending, but then it also goes by so quickly. And they mention, this is something that they always say, it's like drinking water from a fire hose. They'll mention that all the time. You don't think that it's true, but it, it really is. And my advice would be, you can't know anything. You get into a hospital setting, there are doctors still learning. There are people learning 
um, you know, 10, 13, 14 years out of their degree. So you can't know any, everything in these first two years. You can't know everything in the first four years of medical school. Um, these pre-clinical pre years are fun though. They're, they're really fun. And kind of when I mean fun, oh, sorry. I was supposed to show that before. Uh, <laughs> long years, uh, drinking water from a fire hose. Um, this is kind of what a week looks like. Um, so you've got PBLs, which is your small group learning. Um, you've got clinical skills where you're learning basically how to do examinations, histories, dealing with patients. Um, and then you've got practical stuff with uh, anatomy labs, um, with cadavers and dry labs with um, uh, slides. Um, yeah, but when I say that it's fun, it really is the most fun these first two years. So these are some pictures from our uh, med ball open bar. Um, I showed you my LinkedIn profile from before. Maybe this could be my new LinkedIn profile pic. Um, I think this was early on in the night as well. So yeah, it is fun. Um, and I ended up, you know, yeah. Ugh. All right, this is also, what makes it fun these are your pbl groups this is a these are the people that you'll learn with you rotate through um eight of these groups sorry four of these groups and you just teach each other everything you spend do all your clinical years together you grow your hair and your beards to look um like a vagrant together um so yeah um yeah it is just uh, I, I miss it a little bit but it was a lot of work um, and then you have your clinical years. So this rotating through one of five clinical schools, you put your preferences in there, you get assigned to one. I'm currently at the Geelong Clinical School um, and that encompasses the University Hospital Geelong and the Grace McKellar Rehab Centre down here in Geelong. Um, you, you basically just, and then so the other clinical schools are Ballarat Clinical School and the Ballarat Health Service. Eastern Clinical School, which is the only Melbourne clinical school. So if you have family in Melbourne, you can go back and basically you're only doing your first two years in Geelong before being back with your family and friends um, and social supports. The Warrnambool Clinical School, which is a, you know, a really amazing school down on the coast that prides itself on um, clinical teaching. And then Ruckus, which is a rural community clinical school where you're, you're assigned to a small town, you're in a GP clinic, um, or a health service there and it's one or two students and you basically have almost free reign to see every single part of that health service, which is so if you're an independent learner, this is probably where you want to be going. Um, this is me. This is me in the Geelong Clinical School. Um, this is kind of life at the moment, simulating in simulations, um, wearing masks um, and uh, no real babies. But the, in, when you're in the hospital, um, you are, you have full access to the patients, you examine them, you ask them questions, you, you basically, you don't have free reign to do what you want, but you have free reign to see who you want to see, ask questions that you want to see, look at x-rays um, and kind of immerse yourself in what life in the hospital is like. Um, these are the rotations through third and fourth year. You do medicine, surgery, women's health, children's health um, and then in fourth year you do a little bit more of the intricate stuff anesthetics a, a long gp rotation mental health aged care and rehab um, so yeah so i'm just going to finish up kind of my presentation here so with a few of the the key points so how do you get the most of where you are at the moment so whether you're in first year second year third year or you have graduated last year you've got to reach out to others going it alone may seem romantic. You're a lone wolf who's done everything for yourself and you don't need nobody, but you do. Um, asking others for support and then supporting others is the number one key to success in my mind. So I really love um, what I do with med mentors, speaking to you guys and speaking to people and helping people with interview prep and whatnot. Um, and because, you know, you never know who you're going to be colleagues with down the line. And they might remember you and it just makes your life and their life better. Um, don't be afraid to look dumb. Um, as you can see previously here, don't be afraid to look dumb. Um, 
enjoy studying, find a way to make it interesting, interesting, whether that's Khan Academy, whether that's doing Anki, whether that's doing role plays with your friends on, you know, doing in, you know, interpretive dances of the Krebs cycle or whatever you still have to learn in undergrad that you'd never ever use um, in medicine. Um, just find a way to make it interesting because if you don't enjoy it, then you won't do well. The same thing applies for honors. A lot of people have this idea that if you do honors, it's a guaranteed you know, boost to your marks. But if you don't enjoy an honors project, you are essentially doing 40 or 50 hours of unpaid work in a field that you hate. Um, and I think that that's probably in the long run more detrimental than any um, increase to marks that you can get. And then, you know, don't let set, setbacks get you down. I'm a, I'm a quite a different case in that I was very lucky to have a lot of luck on my side. A lot of things fell into my lap um, and a lot of other people might not feel like um, things are going well for them at the moment, especially with COVID. But if you put yourself out there and find opportunities, um, things will start kind of falling into place, you know, hopefully. And then just get kind of get involved, um, whether you're a past shooter or through Deucer or through Dubs, et cetera. So like I said before, I said that I'm putting ideas out into the world and putting pressure on myself by wanting to get into medicine. So I'm going to put it into, out into the world that, you know, this is where I want to go after medicine. I know it's early to make decisions about what you want to do, but um, I finished my women's health rotation recently and it was the most wonderful experience. Um, kind of helping women give birth um, is probably the most privileged experience that you can have, um, you know, being allowed in there in their most private moments is just um, amazing. So that's kind of where I want to go after all of this. Um, so I'm putting that out there into the world just to hopefully it uh, eventuates. Um, this is me speaking in uh, at Dubs or Med Mentors last year and uh, this is probably a, a really good thing as well. Don't fall in love with GAMSAT questions. I just kind of like that little uh, juxtaposition there. All right. Thank you everybody. That's the end of my presentation. Um, I've got a few questions that have been sent in. Um, but if anybody has any questions now, um, I'm more than happy to answer them. Lovely. Thank you so much for that. That was really informative and it was a really nice presentation to hear from. Um, yeah, if anyone had any questions, feel free to just add them in the chat or private message them to one of us. Um, Jet, if you wanted to read out some of the questions we got sent in. Yeah, sure. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for coming to speak to us. Um, it's one of the most informative talks I've ever been to, to be honest. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, some of the questions that were sent in were um, attempting to enter medicine can be hard enough as it is on your, on your mental well-being with how competitive and stressful the process is. What impact does the pressure of medical school and the thoughts that you will one day be responsible for lives in the future have on your or the mental health of the students? Um, do you believe enough is being done to support the mental well-being of students? Perfect. So this is actually one of the ones that I've copied and pasted from um, the pre prepared questions. Um, look, this is something that you, you feel like you're going to think about a lot, but what ends up happening in, in reality is that, um, you know, you have to make decisions. And if your decisions are based on the best knowledge that you have at the time, if your decisions are based on what is safest for the patient, um, then, you know, what if the consequences ended up being poor? Um, it's a real tough one. I don't think too much about some of the decisions. Well, I don't have to make any decisions in medical school. Um, I see that uh, doctors feel like uh, doctors don't really spend much time on the decisions because they know so much and they know what the correct decisions are. And usually what happens when mistakes happen is miscommunication more than poor decisions. So if, you're, if you make a decision based on the information that you have, um, I don't think that it would weigh too badly on your mental health. Um, um, and also, yeah, it's a real tough one because in medical school, you're, 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 
you're, you're so observational and you're not really involved in the decision making that you can't really, I can't really put my, you know, feet in the shoes of people who are like, making those decisions. Um, maybe I'll worry about it when I get to it, but hopefully not. But I do really think that if you, if you make a decision based on the information that you have and you know that 99, 999 times out of a thousand is the correct decision and then something happens because of some, you know, freak accident, I don't think that you can spend time worrying about that. Um, do I believe that enough's being done to support the mental well-being of students? Um, students in general, probably not. Students in medicine, especially at Deakin, definitely. We have our own dedicated um, psychologist that just works with the medical school and we have access to her um, kind of seven days a week and we can make next day appointments to speak to her. Um, and she's just wonderful. They have, um, you know, well-being days throughout the year. Uh, we have lots of, you know, luck. One of the lucky things about medical students is that we can, uh, pharmaceutical, not pharmaceutical companies, medical indemnity companies love to sign us up early. So we get free food and free um, events throughout the whole year. So that's really good for mental health and well-being. Um, but yeah, so Deakin Medicine does really well for, the mental well-being of students but in saying that um, people put a lot of pressure on themselves to do well and uh, uh, you can get a little, little bit caught up in being the best um, and knowing everything but you just can't do that you need to kind of focus on you first and um, everything should fall into place from there yeah that's really amazing uh, to know that where we want most of us will probably end up putting as a preference really does a lot um, to accommodate their students. Um, we did have a question in the chat um, that Ivan did answer, but if you wanted to give a view of it, um, yep. view on it. Uh, do September GAMSATs count and why didn't you use your 69? Um, so um, so my September, September GAMSATs do count for the next cycle, but you put your applications in in June. So I use my March GAMSAT to apply in June. Obviously, I couldn't use my September GAMSAT for that application. I only sat that GAMSAT because I um, had uh, gotten the email of death from Deakin or from GAMSATs. Yeah. Yeah. It was really interesting to see yeah. that they checked their mind. And also, <laughs> and also, I do want to say that I, I'm very lucky in that I was able to afford to do four GAMSATs. I know a lot of people can't. So, um, yeah. Um, do we want to move on to the next question? Yeah. Um, as a third year, in what in what a way? Oh, in a, as a third year, in what? Pre, well, I can't even. Sorry. Uh, presume would be begin to be your clinical years. Yep. Do you ever become accustomed or desensitized to the pain slash suffering of patients? I'm scared a career in medicine will leave me cold. Is something that occurs, and if so, how do you remain present with each patient as a person and not a case? So this is this is a really good question because this is something that you think about and you feel like, am I losing my um, empathy? Am I losing sympathy when you start seeing patients? You do start seeing patients as cases, but if you um, if you stop seeing patients as cases, so here, here's the thing that uh, one of the lovely registrars here told me is that when you're in the room, every patient is your grandmother. You have to care for them. You have to show empathy for them. You have to, um, you have to, you know, feel for them. You have to empathize with what they're going through. But once you leave the room, you can't take that with you. You can't let you know, their pain become your pain because then what happens is that that can cloud your judgment. It's the same reason why as a doctor, you can't um, treat your own family because then emotion takes hold. Um, you'll, never, you'll never become cold. You will be upset when patients die. You will be upset when, um, you know, things happen to patients, but you need, you need to have that distance between you and the patient um, in order to make good decisions. You never become desensitized to the pain of patients. That's why, um, you know, that's why we probably overprescribe um, or prescribe analgesia, um, so pain meds, um, because we know that, you know, these patients are going through pain and we don't want to see that. We don't want them going through that as well. Um, but it's a really good question. 
Actually, yeah. I answered it well. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty interesting to think that we have such a view on our own family members, um, different to everyone else around us. Um, and if you look at as your family. Um, next question would be, would it be possible to get a very honest and raw account of what the workload in medicine during the theory years is actually like? Um, I'm in my third year of biomed at Deakin and often find myself feeling overwhelmed, stressed and swimming against the current. I've always dreamed of medicine and now it is what I want to do because of personal reasons, but I'm scared if I'm struggling now, the workload will be simply too much. Yeah, so this is probably a good place to start is having this kind of preclinical timetable. This is probably the same throughout the first two years. Um, the workload is, look, you probably work more, but it's more interesting. And the stress of having to get perfect marks isn't there. So the pressure, I feel less pressure in medicine first two years than I did in my last two years of Deakin undergrad because every mark in undergrad counts because, you know, a drop mark can push you from a high distinction to a distinction. Um, whereas in the first two years of Deakin, un Deakin medicine, it's an ungraded pass. So it's a pass fail. You don't get any marks. Um, so you don't have to worry about, um, you know, getting every, ounce of knowledge out of every subject or topic and getting 99 on every test. Um, Deacon wants you to learn how to do things, get big, basic and broad concepts, um, under, understand them really well. But the workload is what you really make of it. A lot of people treat it like a full-time job and go from eight till five, Monday through Friday, and don't look at a textbook from Saturday to Sunday. Um, and that's probably the best way to go about it. Um, if you think, um, you probably don't need to don't do more than that as well. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about the workload in medicine because like I said, if you just do the work um, and you don't have to go above and beyond, then you'll be fine. And the pressure doesn't really build up as long as you stay on top of things. But that's the same in undergrad as well. Yeah, um, it's quite daunting if I think about myself <laughs> um, yeah. from this year. Um, in my first year, uh, I'd probably, as personal, um, juggle between whether doing medicine or not um, because I was struggling to get my feet on the ground uh, with the way university worked. So, yeah, I can understand what, where they're coming from. Yeah, and I think that's one of the problems with undergrad going from high school to undergrad they're so completely different you're kind of left in your um left to your own devices whereas medicine's more like high school where they will support you and want you to do well um so that's probably i would say in that in that um in that way medicine might be a little bit easier than undergrad because there's a lot of people who don't want you to fail and they won't let you fail yeah it's uh you make me feel really comforted. <laughs> um, the next one is, I'm a nursing student at the moment who is excited about potentially studying medicine in the future. A problem I've found in nursing is that the models or diagrams, um, diagrams and examples of clinical presentations of illness in uni are predominantly shown on white patients. This means that when I am on a placement and encounter patients of colour, I often can't identify what is occurring as the physical symptoms can present differently. Is this a problem which also occurs in medicine or is more being done to properly equip students to deal with the difference in presentation? I always feel awful and like I'm letting people down. Yeah, this is another great question. Um, I haven't experienced this myself, um, mainly just because of, you know, just lack of, um, patients that are presenting that aren't Caucasian down here in Geelong. Um, but uh, there is a project being run by a, uh, by the Royal College or the Royal Hospital in London. Um, and it's called the Skin Deep Project. And what that does is that that's actually getting a database of, um, uh, you know, diagnoses of skin types and skin colors to show what different rashes and things look like on um, different colored skin. 
Um, so if whoever wrote that question wants to go have a look at this, um, that would be probably where I would start. It is definitely, medicine really is, um, you know, Caucasian centric. Um, you know, if you look at clinical trials, if you look at, um, you know, dosages for drugs, it's based on, you know, populations of uh, um, Caucasian men between the ages of 18 and 40. Um, and it's very hard to, it's very hard to kind of reconcile, you know, giving best practice when 90% of the world's population hasn't really been included in uh, the decision making for dosages and drugs and things like that. So, but things like this are, um, are really great. The Skin Deep Project, Deacon, hmm, Deacon teaches us the curriculum that we, you know, probably the main curriculum that is, is being taught around the country. And um, this hasn't really come up, um, but once this person gets into medicine in the future, or even now, you know, she, she, she or he um, could look at um, creating a database like that, especially in Australia for, you know, more Australian centric or even indigenous centric um, diseases. Yeah, it's pretty, it's amazing how we have such a diverse culture in Australia and like most of the models are based off one specific um, type of person. Yeah, it makes you realise that, you know, those, those gaps in, in health, if, if, if they're, if they are kind of addressed early, you know, how much of a difference that could make. Yeah. Um, following on from that, uh, how do you deal and ration with patients with opposite health beliefs to yourself, such as anti-vax, anti-blood transfusion, while still remaining calm and level-headed? Um, so luckily, um, I haven't had to deal with any of uh, these situations, but we are taught throughout our course um, really how to deal with them. And, and it's the same thing is you just kind of, you need to reason with them. If you ask somebody what their reasons are for being anti-vax, um, they'll usually give you a, like a level-headed reason. You know, I don't want my child to have this or that. I don't think that it's safe for my child. Um, and they're coming from a place where um, they're caring the most about their child. Um, and what you need to kind of, uh, kind of counsel them on is that what that energy that they're feeling, that fear of their child getting sick, it's much more likely to happen if they don't get vaccinated rather than um, if they do get vaccinated. So if you can kind of use that power of that empathy or that sympathy that they have for their child or that worry that they have for their child um, and kind of get them to see that, you know, getting vaccinated is probably um, safer and going to lead to an outcome that's best for their child. Um, Anti-blood transfusion, you know, I don't know what the... The, the, the number of Jehovah's Witnesses or um, Seventh-day Adventists are in, in, in Australia. So I don't know how often that this really does happen in Australia. But again, a, a few things that you can just realise is that people's beliefs are what their beliefs are. If they don't want a blood transfusion and they're over the age of 18, um, and that's what their belief is, it's, you can't let that get to you because it's not affecting you. Um, yeah, well, that's, that's, that's just kind of the way that people make decisions for their own, um, um, based on their own beliefs and information. And, and it, all we can do is counsel them on what will happen, um, if they don't do it. Um, but if there's some other tricky things where, um, if it's, if they're making a decision based on other people, that's when, you know, lawyers and stuff get involved, but that's way above, um, my pay grade or wherever, wherever I am now. And, um, yeah, but the, the, the empathy and, and asking questions about why people people want to do things or don't want to do things is probably the best way to kind of deal with any of these situations. Um, I've actually got a quick question following on from that one. Um, what does that class actually look like in medicine? What is, is that just a textbook you learn you're just going to memorise? No, so here you have PHM, which is Public Health and Medicine. So you have four hours of that on a Friday morning. Um, but every second week you'll have an, 
ELC, which is ethics, law and communication. Um, so you will have, go through case studies and you will have uh, lectures from uh, medical ethicists and bioethicists who will talk you through what the legal parameters are and basically what you do. The, 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 um, the answer always ends up being consult the hospital lawyer, um, which is probably what I'll do every single time something like that comes up. I'll put my hands up and, and just consult the hospital lawyer um, and then let them make the decision. Yeah, it's quite comforting to also know that you're protected as well. Yeah. In every situation. Um, next question. What aspects from your previous study and just life experiences have helped you in medicine that you thought wouldn't? Um, so previous study, I did some languages. I did them in high school. I did them in, um, in uh, an undergrad at Monash as well. That helped me a lot. Um, prefixes and suffixes and Latin roots and Greek roots of words are, you know, I didn't realize how much you could reason um, what a disease is just by, you know, its Latin roots and, and where it comes from. So that was a surprising thing that helped me. Um, working, uh, working for a long time, I worked in an industry predominantly full uh, with customers who were men in their 50s and 60s. Um, and hospitals, I don't know if people have ever been in one, but it's predominantly men in their 50s and 60s who are in here. Um, so that was something that really helped me, um, learning to communicate with them. One of my clinical instructors in the first year said that I have a, uh, a wonderful way with the old fellas. Um, uh, I don't think he put it quite like that. I have a wonderful way with the old guys. Um, and... And I just told him that it was, I've been dealing with them every day for, you know, 10 or 12 years in, in you know, my previous career. So, yeah. But, you know, everybody has their own experiences that they can bring into medicine. You know, medicine shouldn't be a field of bio, I know that it's a biomed society, but it shouldn't be a field of just biomedical graduates. It should be people from all kind of all walks of life who bring their own experiences. And, and Deacon does that. They have a, they have a bonus for, having life experience, being an allied health um, practitioner or having worked full time in a job outside of medicine. Yeah, kind of when you say that, it reminds me of my dad <laughs> wanting to go to the doctor all the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the next one, what really happens if you fail a unit in med school? Um, is this true that you have to redo the year? So, if you fail a unit in med school, if you fall, if you fail in the first year, if you fail between 40 and 50%, you are given the option to resit, uh, do a resit examination where you need to pass. Uh, if you fail that, then you, because of the fact that you can't defer and then units are back to back to back, you know, you do med A, med B, med C, med D um, in the first year, and they only have them in that order. If you fail med A, then the only time that you'll have to do it, you'll be able to do it again is to do it the next year. So you do have to redo the year, unfortunately, but like I said before, it's very rare that somebody will fail. Um, I don't want to, you know, put, you know, false data out there, but I think in our first year out of 150 students, only one person had to redo the year. Um, but they really, they, they'll really, if you're on your track, on way, on your way to failing, they'll pull you up early and then um, offer you extra support. Um, just a question on that one. Did you notice that your peers were um, pressure you to stick with the group? Um, so everyone around you was also just pushing you forward um, to not have to go and be in that situation? Yeah, so I think that everybody... So I'm lucky enough to not have been in a situation where I was worried about failing. Um, the people that have failed have probably tried to go it alone without asking for support. Um, because Deacon is a very collaborative um, kind of group in those first two years. And that's probably because it's pass fail and everybody's trying to find their feet. So everybody's got study techniques and study notes that they share. Everybody shares their notes um, because, you know, there's not this, you're not competing against each other really. Um, so yeah, I feel like 
everybody will bring you up if you ask for the help. Amazing. Mm. Um, are relationships in medicine possible or is it just a dream? How do you, how do people make them work when so much of their time is taken up? Um, they are possible. Um, I'm my long-term relationship with my girlfriend is still going strong. We're actually expecting our first child in February of next year. So they're definitely possible. Um, a lot of people do have relationships fail. Um, a lot of people do have relationships fail, but there's probably more people that have gotten into relationships with each other in medicine than, um, then have failed. So it's almost a net gain of people that are, uh, people that are um, in relationships. If, if you really want a relationship to work, it, it will survive medicine. It doesn't have to encompass you. It doesn't have to become what you are. You can include your partner in your lives. There's a Deakin University Medicine Partners Facebook group where they all kind of gripe about all the weird and wacky things that we say, clinical skills that, um, you know, KHI, knowledge of health and illness, this, um, where they, and then they meet up as well. So there's, you know, support there for partners as well. Amazing. Um, the final question, um, how had working in the hospital in the current pandemic affected your desire to work in healthcare, strengthened or weakened it? Do you think the public have a realistic idea of what it's like on the front line? Um, so have they strengthened or weakened it? It's tough. So we have had, we were very lucky that we have a wonderful clinical director, clinical school director here at um, Geelong who has fought for us as medical students to, to stay in the hospital. Um, he considers us as we probably should be considered as essential workers because in 15 months or so, we're going to be making decisions. We're going to be interns. So we need as much experience as we can. Um, it's scary. It's not, you know, you don't, you're not fearful for your life. It's just, there are moments of panic when a patient will get up to the ward and you haven't, they have been fine and then they start coughing and um, everybody starts kind of freaking out quietly. There's never like a lot of panic. Um, but um, I think people in the hospital are frustrated um, the same way that people outside of the hospital are frustrated, but they're more frustrated that people outside of the hospital aren't not doing the wrong thing, but don't kind of realize that um, we're working so hard in here to kind of keep COVID out of the hospital um, and coming to work, you know, and feeling a little bit scared. Um, and all people are kind of being asked to do at home is just kind of stay at home. Um, it has it made, has it changed my perspective? Yeah, I think it has changed my perspective on life. Um, it's made me regret not going on holidays that I, you know, that I wanted to go on before. Um, it's made me, I remember having a GAMSAT study session early on and my mum calling me up and asking me if I wanted to go see the Book of Mormon, but it was the day before the GAMSAT, so I said no. Um, and the idea that, you know, being in a crowded theatre ever again might be a pipe dream <laughs> um, is kind of scary and there's like a tinge of regret there. It has made me realise that... Um, from your guys' perspective, if you want to do something, you know, life could change completely overnight. You might as well go for it. Um, and in saying that, this might be going off on a tangent. If you feel like you're too old or you feel like you don't know enough or you feel like this and that, um, just remember you're going to be 35 or 40 anyway. You might as well be 35 and a doctor. You might as well be 40 and a med student because you're going to get there anyway. Uh, so you might as well just kind of, go hard or go home yeah really. But yeah i don't know if that answers the question it's really weird yeah. to live by um i tell you that from the bottom of hearts we do support what you guys are doing um and i think we're all trying our best to help you guys out um and help ourselves actually yeah um, um, but i also want to i say that we have we have a huge focus in deacon on public health medicine 
if anybody is the real heroes, apart from the people that are on the real front line of COVID, it's those people making those um, unpopular decisions because they know that um, what, you know, the decisions that they're making are affecting everybody. Um, so, yeah, so if, you know, if you, if you ever want to look into the, who I think are probably the real heroes, apart from those people on the front line, is those public health doctors who are making the decisions that nobody really wants to make. Um, that is all the questions we have for today. Um, we just wanted to thank you for giving us this amazing story. Um, one that I, it's literally one in a million. I've never heard a story like that. Um, and the way that you just landed <laughs> where you wanted to be. And it's truly amazing how you got there and how hard you worked to get to where you are. Um, I think the March really put it into perspective. Um, and yeah, just a big thank you from all of us for being here and taking time to share this all with us. Thank you, everybody. And then, you know, you can, you can do it is pretty much what I'll say. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. All right. Very See much. ya. Have a good one.